Hi, Mike. Welcome to Foot Traffic. I'm so excited to have you here today. Stacey, I'm, I'm pumped to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So I read the book Profit First two years ago while I was on vacation. And at the time, I had already been in business for 15 years wow. and grossing seven figures. And I remember reading your book thinking, how have I been doing this all wrong for 15 years? <laughs> How is this possible that I even made it to where I was at that time without implementing any of this stuff? So it was really a big game changer. And I'll tell you, um, it was a big eye opener reading it, but I really didn't start implementing it to this past year. And whoa, the difference in our business this past year. So thank you, first of all, but now I'm excited to get to chat more and share you with my audience. You're very welcome. And you also sound very normal. Like <laughs> I've gotten feedback, it's such a blessing from so many entrepreneurs now and most of us we're growing our business you know the sales are growing but the stress level is growing with it and the profitability isn't and then when we hear about profit first or any system we don't jump right on it the implementation it has it's a little shift or a big shift in the way we think so the transition's usually a bumpy one so that's pretty normal yeah and and that's the thing it's like i knew i was the normal entrepreneur but i didn't want to be normal after reading that yeah. book so that was exciting so you do a really good job in the book of explaining and using examples that don't have to do with money or business. And one was um, talking about smaller plates. Can mm. we talk about that a little bit? Because when you said that, it all of a sudden clicked for me in my, with money. Absolutely. I was watching a television show. Uh, you know, my background is I struggled with business finances. I too had businesses that had, one company was achieved $7 million in revenue in a service professional. And I, and I was broke uh, and, and struggling refinancing my house to support it. So I wanted to find a system that would help me with cash management. By happenstance, I'm watching a television show and there's a fitness instructor on there talking about diets. And she's up there and she goes, do you realize in the US plates have doubled in size? So 300 years ago, they were the size of what we consider a coffee saucer or dessert plate. In 300 years, our plates have doubled in size, but our behavior stayed consistent. 300 years ago, the people that time would fill up their plate, and as their moms and dads said, they'd clean up their plate. Plates double in size, therefore our portions are not doubled in size, but we follow the instruction set, for clean up your plate, as mom and dad said. So now we're consuming double the calories, and as a society, as a globe, our waistline's doubled. So what was fascinating, this fitness instructor said, simply get smaller plates at your house. It forces portion control. It's forced frugality. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the exact challenge I have with my money. The bigger the serving of money is getting, the more I'm consuming of it. That's the problem. It's not about making more money. It's about controlling the consumption of the money that I am making. So what I realized is we need small plates. And in practice with Profit First, what we do, and you have to be doing this at your bank. You do your bank because it intercepts your natural path. Most entrepreneurs don't follow their accounting system on a regular basis, occasionally, but more regularly, they go into their bank account, they see what their balance is, and they're making decisions based upon the balance. Therefore, at our bank, we set up multiple accounts, I call them small plates, mm -hmm. allocate money to these different plates prior to spending a dime. So money comes in, say $1,000 comes in, you don't have $1,000 to spend. Some of that is reserved for profit. Some is there to pay the salary of the owner, which is different than profit. Mm -hmm. Some's there for the tax liabilities, the operations of the business, maybe inventory purchase. The money gets carved up. And now you realize for the operations of the business, you don't have $1,000. You may have like two or $300. And it right sizes you around the right size plate and you consume the money more prudently and appropriately. Yeah, that makes so much sense too. And I will tell you, as somebody who's been doing this for a while and, and have hit seven figures, I think I was telling myself these stories in my head up, but when I make this, it'll get easier. I'll fix right. my habit then, right? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> It's the exact same thing. I was like, oh, when my first business started, I was doing like $100,000 in revenue. I was like, I should be making money. I said, it must be at 250. Yeah. I hit 250,000, nothing. And then ultimately I was like, it's gotta be the million dollar mark. That's when everyone gets rich. And I was in the most difficult financial circumstance ever. Sales is not the solution, yet it is the default assumption of entrepreneurs. Our gut says, you know what? Need more clients, need more sales. That might bring profit. Revenue, though, translates to stress. So the more sales you have in the organization, the more obligation you're putting on your business. You have to deliver now on your promises yeah. to your customers that they're paying you for. So increasing revenue is increasing stress. And the person that carries the stress is the owner. Mm. I, know business, I know a business owner, sadly, $250 million company. Sounds glorious. Until this, you meet this guy, he was under such stress and they were never profitable. In fact, they had a file chapter 11 recently, which is devastating and sad. Yeah. Revenue is clearly a vanity metric. 
It is about profitability. That is where sustainability is. Yeah. So do you just cringe when you hear people in the online, like the digital marketing space, like $10 million launches and this, because you just know it's probably not that pretty in the inside. I cringe. I cringe. I cringe when I used to do that. I was the big <laughs> dick. I can, I can walk in and I'm like, hey, I have a $2 million company, everybody. And it's like thought that was so cool. And then once yeah. I hit 7 million, it's like, 7 million, who does this? And it was just this big arrogance. I'm like, yeah. in retrospect, I'm ashamed. I am totally ashamed of behaving that way. Yeah. I now do feel this uh, twist in my stomach when I go to any kind of conference or meeting where it's entrepreneurs, it is the how big is it conf con mm -hmm. conference or discussion all the time. How many employees do you have? That's how big is it? What's your yeah. sales like? How big is it? And the, the braggadociousness over this top line number, it is vanity. I am more impressed by a business that does say $500,000 in revenue and the owner's taking home 100 grand than yeah. a company that's doing 10 million and the owner's going broke. It's mm -hmm. all about the bottom line. It's all about the health of the business. Yeah. So I want to ask you, when you first get started and there is this like, uh, like pulling and of, should I pay myself or should I put that money back in the business? I know it's very hard for many of us to finally pull that salary out thinking we're like stealing from the company or they, the business needs it. What do you tell that entrepreneur who hasn't yet paid herself or isn't paying himself the right amount yet? Yeah, she needs to start paying herself immediately. I mean, think first why we started our business. Usually there's two reasons. We're doing something that brings us joy, I hope, and impact to others. Secondly, because of financial freedom. And yet the irony is most businesses are stress causing, no joy, and the entrepreneur's going broke. It's the absolute, absolute opposite of what we envision. So that's a problem. And just like health and so forth, you don't go to the gym and have the amazing workout and, and your rips the next morning. You got to build to this. Well, the same thing is with profitability. We need to get the discipline of going to that gym, the profit gym in this case, from day one. We need you to pay yourself. Now, the interesting thing is when we start allocating money to pay the owner and we reserve money for profit, there's less money for the business, which is basically telling the business, this is actually what you have and is available to you. Because if I want to achieve profitability, if I want to pay myself, this is what you must work with. The moment will come, because I've done this myself, that your business won't have enough money to pay bills. And if you can't pay your bills, that's your business telling you, you can't afford these bills. There's a mm -hmm. fundamental flaw in the structure of the business. Cut costs, increase margin. You must start paying yourself immediately, and the business will then tell you what's appropriate for itself. Yeah. So using that as a wake up call of this is what's really in here as the operating expense and knowing you have those others allocated. Yeah. Otherwise you're just going to say, well, I'm not making money. I need to sell more, which puts more organizational stress on you and you still don't take the money. There's this concept called Parkinson's law. Theorists from the 1950s studying human behavior. And what he stated was that as a resource expands in its availability, our consumption will increase at the same rate to consume what's available. For example, if you and I are negotiating a contract and I say, hey, I'll get to you in one week, it'll take me a week to get to you. Yeah. The same people having the same conversation about the same contract, same parameters, if I say I'll get to you in one day, I'll likely get to you in a day. Compress the resource of time, I become more efficient in its utilization. Well, this is true for time. It's true for money. As money increases in its availability, our necessity, and I'm putting air quotes around it, to use it increases. We justify, I need to buy this. I need to reinvest and plow back. I need to do what I need to do. And now uh, we're actually putting more stress on the organization and the likelihood of becoming profitable is, is nil because our rates are increasing. The same. What we need to do is put this gap in. So what I'm saying in profit first, as your revenue is growing or even if it's staying flat, we're going to take a predetermined percentage of that money out, stick it into a, that profit account you set up at your bank, mm -hmm. hide it even away from yourself if you can't see it. And now we've put this forced gap in there and Parkinson's law will restrict us to work with what's truly available. Just as an example, the grading, greatest savings mechanism of all time in U.S. history is the 401k, forced savings. It comes out before your net pay. Yeah. And what happens? We get our net pay and we live our lifestyle off of it. If you don't implement a 401k, all of a sudden your lifestyle expands to meet what's coming in and there's no savings. Right. Same kind of principle. Yeah, all of a sudden there's nothing left over versus if you don't see it, it's just out of sight, out of mind. That's right. I love that. Okay. So you talk about these four core principles and one was using small plates. The next one you said is serve sequentially. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Stacey, that, that translates back to food. It was interesting. This instructor on television says that most people default to their preference. So I like steak, potatoes, you know, vegetables that are served together. I don't like vegetables, to be honest. So what do I do? I eat the steak. Mm -hmm. Even though I know the most important food item with the nutrients, the fiber, the vitamins, 
is the vegetables. And in fact, all society knows that, but the most discarded food item at restaurants are vegetables. So what's wrong with us? Nothing's wrong with us. The sequence is wrong. If you simply serve vegetables first and nothing else, you'll actually start consuming some vegetables. Yeah, the edamame isn't so bad. Right. Then when the steak gets served, or whatever your preference is, you'll consume less of it because you had the vegetables first. It brings balance. In the profit first system, our uh, vegetables, the health of our business, profitability is pushed off to the very end. In fact, the foundational formula we're told is it's sales minus expenses equals profit. So most businesses in the sequence say, I need to sell more at the top of the formula. Yeah. I need to spend more. We don't like to say spend, reinvest, grow. We prefer that. And what's left over is profit. It can wait. It's called the bottom line after all. It's the last, it's the last thing of the year. It's the final take. All those things indicate it's insignificant. What we're going to do is flip the formula. What I'm saying is it's sales minus profit equals expenses. You need revenue. That's how you bring cash in, but then you need to preserve it. So in sequence, always allocate money toward your profit first, hide that money, and then do the remaining allocations. This will start to build profit muscle. And uh, I've done this. We now have over 300,000 businesses have done this. So we have a lot of practical experience. When a business takes its profit first and you as the owner do that allocation, I don't care if it's 10 bucks or, or 10,000 bucks, whatever dollar amount is, it feels good mm -hmm. to be putting money in that profit account. You've taken your vegetable. A dopamine response occurs. That like, oh, I want more of that. And we continue to build that profit muscle. So yeah. the sequence is profit comes first, operating expenses come after. Yeah. And seeing, you know, in my bank account, those other accounts and seeing the profit, the owner's compensation, it does feel good. It's like the dopamine hit you're talking about. And it makes me go, this is working. And yes. it makes me want to do it even more. Right. Yes. That, that's the exact emotional response. Profit first. Some people confuse it with an accounting system. It's not, it's a behavioral system. It works with the natural behavioral patterns of most entrepreneurs. And to your point, Stacey, you log into that account, you see the money reserved for your benefit first. Yeah. Now the business is serving us and we feel good. Yeah. Well, and we feel more secure because I remember, you know, at the end of the year crossing my fingers, like, what are my, what's my tax bill going to oh. look like, right? Oh. Now, now I'm allocating for it and I feel good that there's a fund sitting there ready for taxes. It's yeah. Just so a lot of people don't realize this, that your business, regardless of the formation, your business can reserve and pay your taxes for you. So if you have an LLC or a sole proprietorship, the, the business will write a check out to it. If you have an S corp or C corp, the business will do what's called a tax distribution reimbursement. It re reimburses you for the taxes that came out of your paycheck. But either way, the business can pay your taxes. And the feeling is great. The, the funny thing is I ask and invite readers to email me all the time. And I'm so blessed. They do email me all the time. My favorite time of year is year end or quarter end. Mm -hmm. I get emails from people saying, I can't tell you how happy I am paying my taxes, which right. sounds effing bizarre. <laughs> I, I get it. But when you don't have to worry about taxes ever again and your business pays it for you, mm -hmm. the relief is extraordinary. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, there comes a point when you get a tax return and then all of a sudden your business starts doing well enough that you all of a sudden pay money. And I didn't realize that until I got slapped with a $20,000 tax bill that I was not ready to pay. Right. So I really want people to hear this, that you might not have this problem now, but you will at some point, hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. You know, the number one largest bill for most businesses, it's their taxes. Yeah. It supersedes rent, sometimes even payroll for most businesses taxes. And yes, the most ill-prepared we are is for taxes until now. So what we're going to do is set up a tax account at your bank. We act this way and realize this. You are, we are a legalized agent for the government. We are mandated by law to pay taxes. So when you make a dollar, you're not taking a dollar. A portion does go to profit. A portion goes to pay your salary. A portion goes to your obligation as an agent to the government to pay the government. So we're going to allocate just like a sales tax. When you charge a sales tax, that's actually collecting money on behalf right. of the government. Income tax is treated the same way. So a dollar is not a dollar. A portion of that goes to the government. We allocate this tax account. And then when the government comes a knock, and, and trust me, they knock loudly. Now we can just say, here you go. Leave me alone. Right. right. Okay. I love this. All right. The next step is remove temptation. So can we talk about that? Yeah. So all this stuff translates to physical or dietary needs. It's interesting how physical fitness translates to fiscal fitness. Yeah. So, um, my addiction is chocolate chip cookies, Stacey. i addicted. And um, I just started preparing for this athletic event with my son. And he's 18. I'm not. Um, <laughs> so I need the coach. And um, the coach said, you got to get off bad carbs. And uh, I told him about my addiction to chocolate chip cookies. And his response was, get them the hell out of the house. Yeah. Asian is uh, 
when we try to resist it, we try to use willpower. Will, willpower is like a muscle, it fatigues. So the only way to assure not consuming what we shouldn't have is removing its availability. When it comes to profit, also taxes, this money will start accumulating at your business because you've set these multiple envelopes or accounts at your bank. So we're dividing money up before we spend it. The money will start accumulating. Well, that day will come where you can't pay your bills or you want to hire a new employee or, or invest in something. And you're like, I don't have the money to do this. That's your business telling you you're not ready. But we look at the profit account and say, oh, there's some money there. Or look at the tax account and say, well, there's some money. I'll borrow. Yeah. Well, when you borrow from yourself, you start stealing from yourself and this whole system becomes a shell game. It defeats it. Therefore, we need to remove the temptation from borrowing from ourselves. Set up a hidden bank account, a profit account. We call it the profit hold, a secondary bank. We do the same thing at the tax account. We transfer money to these second accounts and they sit there and they hide away. So when I log into my bank account, that's how I manage my business. Now I log in, I see money allocated toward my pay. So I know I'm getting paid and I see money allocated toward the operations of the business, but the profit that's been carved out and sitting there temporarily now has been transferred out. So it's out of sight, out of mind. The power of, again, is Parkinson's law. Yeah. Now we are constrained to work within what's available of the OPEX. That's the lifestyle of your business. And you personally, the owner's pay, that's your lifestyle account. So now you start adjusting your lifestyle to the appropriate salary as an owner and the business adjusts its lifestyle to the salary, if you will, of yeah. the business. With this money removed out of sight, out of mind, it accumulates and then uh, we don't depend on it. But we will do a profit distribution occasionally, periodically, every 90 yeah. days. And that, that becomes a very glorious day because that money that's been piling up on the side now is released to you as a shareholder. Okay. I love this. So um, the last piece of this is enforce a rhythm. So how often, when should we be doing this? Yeah. There's a couple of rules we found. Uh, one guiding principle is what we call the 1025 rule. And the concept here is this, as money flows into your business, historically, business owners are very reactionary. We see bills piling up and the second a, a check comes in as a deposit, we're like, finally, and then we, we, we feel great for that day. Business is amazing. Yeah. All this money's flowing in. The next morning we feel miserable because we use that money to pay all our bills and life sucks again. Right. It's a very reactionary kind of bipolar experience being a business owner. So we're going to enter a, a rhythm or a sequence. And what we're going to do is every 10th and 25th of the month, we're going to allow money to accumulate into what we call an income account at our primary bank. The money piles up on that trigger day, the 10th or the 25th, all the money in the income account gets allocated to these other accounts based upon percentages. The profit then is transferred out to a profit hold account, so it's out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the taxes. The owner's pay is used to pay the owner, and the business runs off of the operating expenses. By doing this every two weeks, it starts getting us into a flow and less reactionary. Okay. But the other benefit is by doing this on the 10th and 25th, your OPEX will be funded on those days. When you pay your bills on the 10th or 25th, the 10th bills will arrive usually by mid-month to your vendors. So now you're paying your vendors on time. That's when half our bills are due. Yeah. When you repeat this process on the 25th, the other half of bills are usually due at the end of the month. Those will arrive on time. It gets you into a rhythm paying your vendors on time and a rhythm of making sure that cash flow is not reactionary. Yeah. One last component, every 90 days, I read to it, that money in that profit account, every 90 days, we do what's called a quarterly profit distribution. And as we're recording this, we're about a month and a half away a month and 21 days, uh, I'm counting it, till the next profit distribution. That money's piled up. You take out a portion of it. Now, in the book, I explain uh, what percentage you should take. But as a rule of thumb, it's 50%. So if I have $2,000 that piled up, $1,000 stays as a reserve for future profit shares, and 1000 comes out to me, and I get that as a bonus at the end of mm -hmm. every quarter. And I can do what I want with it. The goal is it must, though, reward the shareholder. It never gets reinvested or plowed back into a business. That means it's simply an expense again. We call it a profit, right. but now we're spending it, so it's an expense. Profit, just like a large corporation, is always used to reward the shareholder, the small business owner of the business. Yeah. And that is so crucial because when I wasn't paying myself, I started to almost feel like I was playing with fun money. Like if it came in, it was just like, well, what do I want to spend it on? Because it wasn't ever coming to me. And when I started paying myself, it started to really feel like real money here. And what I made, what my decision was really impacted me. So it was a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. As people go through this journey, um, the emotional stages we go through. Yeah. I, I got so many reports and, and case studies now on it. It's fascinating. Here's the, the general arc. The first day people hear about profit first, there's uh, either holy cow, this is a game changer, or there's like, this is too easy to work. It's too simple. This is not going to mm. work. So there's either great resistance or great enthusiasm. Either way, when a business starts it, usually in the first week or two, people are like, holy cow, this works. Yeah. You can take your profit first. This is pretty amazing. 
Then the dip happens. It's usually about two weeks to a month or two into it. And you're like, I can't pay my bills. This <laughs> system's not working. I, this saying, is I had that moment for sure. I was like, I don't think I'm doing this right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. I'm not doing it right. It's too wrong. That dip is yeah. very dangerous because some people say, I got to exit. It's yeah. actually in that dip where the greatest education happens. Your business is telling you there's something fundamentally yeah. wrong with the business. Too much cost in some cases. Usually it's too little margin. We got to increase prices or dictate a higher premium for the value we're providing. Then we have the outside and, and the, the upcoming, and that, that continues on to perpetuity. Once people start to understand this and get into the rhythm, then they start pushing their business forward saying, what if we move up those profit percentages from five to six to maybe 10 or 20%? What if I pay myself more? And they start tweaking their business and that becomes this joyful ride of permanent profitability. I've done this for myself. I've done this now for, I'm approaching my 11th year. I've had 43 consecutive quarters of profit distributions. It has been life-changing for me. Yeah. Well, I think it was we maybe like February ish that I started doing this, realizing, okay, this isn't working. I'm having problems. And I had to look at my expenses and it was yeah. really hard for me to say, but I, I don't, I need that. Like I didn't want to let it go. And I cut out $8,500 in expenses. And I was certain, wow. I was certain that this was going to like horribly affect my business. Yeah, right, 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 right. No. And it almost, I felt stupid thinking I was so certain that that was giving me this positive return on investment when my numbers kept growing and I cut out that kind of expense. That's the shocking thing. It is. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Cause I'm yeah. revealing the humanity that's in us all. There's this thing called loss aversion. Uh, profit first again, it's all based on behavioral functions of, of humans, of us. And one of the things is once we possess something uh, or basically possess something, we will do extraordinary things to retain it, including possessing expenses. So mm -hmm. I buy some software, I join that gym membership. I may not go, but I'm like, I, I need to go, so I'm gonna keep this. So we usually possess things for an extra, extended term. Gyms, for example, love it. They know oh, people yeah. are gonna sign up January 1st and they're gonna stay members for 12 to 15 months, and maybe show up three or four times in January and never again. Yeah, That's called loss aversion. We now possess something mentally and we, we will cling to an expense as long as we can. One of my favorite stories, though, about this realization that you had, there's a baseball team called the Savannah Bananas, real baseball team. They're an unbelievable story, and they're highly Googleable. So check them out. They implemented Profit First, and uh, they're in minor league baseball. Basically, no one goes to baseball games like that. There's like 300 average attendees. Yeah. What they started to do is saying, we don't have enough money from our, our fans to, uh, to support a lot of functions, including the scoreboard electricity. They mm -hmm. turned off the scoreboard. Um, and then, you know, you think turn off the scoreboard, you're losing everything. No, what they came to realize is that people that attend actually were there for the entertainment. Shockingly, baseball is a little boring, <laughs> but the entertainment's there. Yeah. They realized we need more entertainment, but we can't afford the entertainers. But they had baseball players. These are volunteer baseball players from yeah. colleges. We got the baseball players. The first day of practice at a Savannah Bananas baseball game or team meeting is uh, how to line dance, not how to pitch or catch. Wow. It's how to line dance. As a result, Savannah Bananas today draws an audience of 4,500, 4,500 people per game, and their costs are lower than most other uh, venues. So their profit has skyrocketed. And to your point, their growth has skyrocketed. Yeah. By taking your profit first, you're forced to be very critical of what's working, what's not, do more of what's working, and jettison what's not. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is not about, oh, go slash your expenses. Don't invest in your business. It's just what is actually giving us that return yes. to give us the profit. So I'm a big believer in spending on the right stuff. Gosh, thank you for that clarity. So many people hear profit first at first, they get the concept and say, just cut costs, cut costs. At a certain point, you cut the muscle of your organization and it crushes your productivity. It's about cutting unnecessary costs. It's about amplifying value, yeah. just as you Absolutely. pointed out. Yeah. Thank you. So before we wrap up, I would love for people to know if this is intriguing to them, where can they find the book? What, what should be their next steps? Like how do they get started? So the, thank you so much for offering this. Yeah. Profit First is the name of the book. It's at Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, every bookstore uh, that you can imagine. Go there and you can get your copy. But I think uh, a great starting point is my own website because you'll get the book parts of it for free. And by the way, it's not just the fluff chapters, it's the impact chapters. You'll see results by getting the free chapters. So go to mikemotorbike.com. My name is Mike Michalowicz. Okay. No one can spell that, Stacey. <laughs> so go to, go to mikemotorbike.com, it rhymes. Once you go to mikemotorbike.com, uh, click on get the tools. You'll get chapters from all my books, the impact chapters. You'll get articles I wrote for the Wall Street Journal as uh, a columnist for them for years. And also I'm a blogger and podcaster, all free at mikemotorbike.com. 
Amazing. Yeah, I've got the same problem with my last name. Nobody knows how to say Tushel. <laughs> no, no. Well, yeah. you guys, Stacy rhymes with what, Macy? <laughs> I don't know. And let me show you, because we're on video. Look at my profit first, my tabs. That's what, what I'm talking tabs? about, Stacy. This was That's what I'm talking about. That I will, I'll screenshot this on Instagram, you guys. I have so many highlighted tabs in this book, which made it very easy to interview you because I'm like, I'm just going to go back to my favorite parts and, and chat with you about it. So this was so fun. You guys, I cannot recommend Profit First enough. Um, and Mike, you have a ton of different books too. I've read Rum Like Clockwork. I know you have a bunch more, um, but definitely you guys go check out Mike. He has such great stuff to offer. And Mike, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate everything you've done for my business too. Stacey, it's been a joy. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.